Th thank you very much, Joachim, and thank you very much, <clears throat> everybody, for coming and um, for for me um, being able to to talk to you. And uh, I like this system where the clock is uh, ticking. So uh, good. Huh? This is backwards. Okay, interesting. Okay, so here we go. So. Um, No, I'm struggling with the system, but that's all right. So, here we go. This is um, a wall of, of biodiversity in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, and it shows 3,000 species. And it's admired by hundreds of thousands of people every year. And the beauty of it is, and that is actually one of the main outcomes of the work of Charles Darwin, that um, all life on Earth has a common descent, and that man is part of this picture. Whether we always behave as if we are in this picture or not is, I suspect, part of this um, conference we are dealing with here now. But scientifically, we know we are part of this world. This is what we are doing to our world. We have, in the last 500 years, um, taken this world apart, destroying the parts that um, support us. And especially the last 200 years have seen um, nature uh, plummeting and the report that we've just heard last Monday from IPES, um, the UN report says that we've reached a crisis as far as nature is concerned. But what we as humans are not do, just doing is taking on nature. We are also reorganizing ourselves as a species. And you can see that here. So this is in green, the percentage of people over the year, over the age of 60 in 2012. In blue, um, the demographics of the world in 2050. And in orange, on all continents, the amount of people that will live in cities. So we've turned from a rural into an urban society and in a, into an aging society. What, however, is um, more worrying, for me at least, is that we seem to be running out of ideas how to govern with the world. This is a report that was um, done in about 2012 on the topic of innovation, and it basically says humans have not progressed beyond boiling water using atomic energy or um, coal. The major innovations have happened in the um, 19th and early 20th century, and since then we are just staring into nothing and just fiddling around. This is also demonstrated in the Sorry, I'm really getting confused here. It's moving on, and it shouldn't. This is also demonstrated here that um, the growth that is so, um, where the West or the world is so dependent on is teetering out quite substantially. So in the Middle Ages, we had a per capita growth in the world cumulative of 0.25%. Then um, it peaked just after the Second World War with 2.5%, and it's now going down, uh, projected here, to the state of the Middle Ages. So this is a study, and the um, citation is there. We can argue about whether this is correct or not, but so we are destroying the world, we are reorganizing ourselves as a species, and we are losing the ability to innovate, potentially innovate ourselves out of the crisis we've created. Um, also, I've learned um, that apparently we are getting less intelligent as a species. So, um, this, however, I think um, leads us more to the organizations that we are. So this guy here is a historian of science and he's looked at the Industrial Revolution and what we may or may not be able to learn from it. 
And he says, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, it becomes very difficult to see how the modern stagnation can easily, um, a cure can easily be had. And there, on this picture, I don't know, does anybody recognize this fellow? He's the one who invented the first modern transport system um, and um, was um, highly against slavery, Josiah Wedgwood, one of the fathers of the Industrial Revolution and the world we see today. He was not an institutionalized natural scientist claiming that he had innovation um, sort of um, that, that he was responsible for innovation, he just basically did it. And what I find interesting from this book is that um, while we have institutionalized science and or academic institutions as are accumulated here, um, we may not necessarily be the institutions that foster and stimulate intellectual innovation. Intellectual innovation should be much wider distributed, perhaps in organizations that are not necessarily associated with it. And I believe that we need um, now bringing technical, scientific, and societal innovation much, much closer together. And I would argue that the kind of institutions um, that society may need are just the institutions um, assembled here, organizations that on the one hand are steeped in science, a deep love and care for nature, and at the same time reach vast publics, so that we perhaps can be the institutions that um, the new age needs and not the ones that have had a good run at it in the last 150 years, like universities or other technical institutes. That, I would argue, might be one of the things we want to discuss um, in this meeting. What kind of institutions we want to be, or society these days, need. And as Josiah Wedgwood might um, sort of symbolize, perhaps you don't really need that type of academic institutions we've all come from. So, for me, as a biologist, the mother of all innovations is, of course, evolution, 3.8 billion years um, of a circular economy. I think we humans are mere beginners, if that, in this game. Just to give you an idea what comes out of these type of innovations, here you have a shark. Um, it hasn't been really collected for any purpose other than to describe the world. But if various types of people have a look at sharks, then these are some of the things that come out of it. You can have um, people that find stimulation in the arts from sharks. You can find people who do better swim there, where that is then banned in the Olympic Games because it's an unfair competitive advantage and perhaps an issue again to deal with the aging society, you suddenly find antibodies in there that might help us to battle Alzheimer's. So there's plenty of things to be discovered in nature, and I would argue we haven't even started scratching the surface uh, going there. This is where we as natural history organizations are found on the Earth, and you can see that that also maps very closely <clears throat> where human populations are, so that means that collections are where people, and people are where collections, so we can perhaps see how we can link these two even better than we do, and how that might be, again, something we want to discuss here. Natural history museums, botanic gardens, and zoos I think are facing a number of challenges, but they can also now, I would argue, begin to reinvent themselves. Three things might drive this reinvention. One is the digital revolution that we can use to our advantage. We can now look at these collections that we hold, be it living or dead, in completely new ways by unraveling um, their, their genomes, and we can engage citizens, um, for example, through citizen science or other 
ways in, in new ways of co-production, not um, giving them knowledge, but helping them to become more knowledgeable and part of a democratic knowledge society, um, which science depends on, but science does too little to actually stabilize or foster, um, which will come back to haunt us, or is already in some countries coming back to haunt us, that we are not, as scientists, politically engaged enough. So, just to give you an idea how some of the organizations are now beginning to address this and how far or how not so far we've come. Um, currently, these 80 organizations in the natural history world try to get together a synthetic view of their collections, um, of which 30% of the organizations come from the Global South, but as you might imagine, natural history collections are heavily skewed towards Europe and North America. Um, we are going to look at about 1.1 billion specimens, and here you can see how, um, as you might imagine with natural history museums, a few organizations can actually provide the bulk of the information which now needs to be looked at as far as it can contain knowledge. And how far have these, in part, world-leading organizations come with exploring their collections? So, not that far, actually. In GBIF, which is the um, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, 1.1 billion records are to be found, and here you can see the density of these records. Red is where the most information is green, is where an absence of information is. And you can see that of the collections of the world um, in natural history museums, only 16% have thus far been given a digital record. So we've done a sixth of the work that we should do. If you look at how far we've looked at the genetic information contained in our collections, um, it's even um, more disturbing because only 1.02% of the specimens um, that we hold in our collections have a genomic um, record. So there's plenty, plenty, plenty of work to do and fantastic opportunities for advances in science but also to ask people to contribute to this uh, knowledge pool. The collections are there, the technology are there and plenty of people out in society we can bring in to engage with nature. So, where do I think we are? We are in a knowledge society, and I would love to live in a democratic knowledge society, which is in part governed by science and technology, but in relation to the challenges that we face, we do need new um, scientific and societal solutions, and they need to be brought together and they need to be thought in a dialogue. We also, I think, all need to engage much more in creating a scientifically literate citizenry. I do not know, the, the most disturbing um, statistic I've read lately, and it may or may not be fake news, I do not know any longer these days, is, and it comes back to the place we are at here, the Vatican, um, in America, apparently 25% of young people um, do not know any longer that the earth is um, a ball. And it doesn't matter to them any longer because day and night have merged into one long video game. So they do not experience day and night any longer, therefore, it doesn't matter to them whether the Earth is flat, round, or square. So, um, however, they still have a right to vote. And um, I think we really need to up to our game to get better, broad knowledge on science, which is so important in forming um, decisions in this, on, for this world. Um, and our institutions, who else than our institutions can teach the world about nature. 
And I think, like with the genomic data, we are only just scratching the surface in relation to what should be our mission. If we want to solve the issues of the world, innovation has to be with participation. So no innovation with participation, Sheila Jasinov's cry for the 21st century. She's one of the uh, most famous sociologists of science um, uh, currently around. Um, we, need to, we need to get on with it. Citizens, as far as we are, who are in the citizen science um, or open science agenda know, do want to engage. It's up to us to provide more opportunities. It's up to us to learn from their willingness to engage. It's up to us to change in relation to what they want from us and not think that we know what we are doing. As, for example, the genomics or the GBIF data show, we think we know what we are doing, but do we do the right thing? I think we've been left alone for too long as organizations, and I think we need new organizations, new institutions, and if not us, who then? So, our organizations, I would argue, need to change. It will not be an easy thing to do, but on the other hand, many of us as organizations have a long and distinguished history. My organization was founded in 1810. I'm part of 6,600 museums in Germany. Germany prides itself as a country of learning and learned institutions. However, of these 6,600 museums in Germany, 85% have been established since the Second World War. So in a way, botanic gardens, zoos, and natural history museums in the field of public engagement science organizations as museums should be, we are a bit like the Catholic Church because over at least 200 years, not 2,000 years, we have been able to adopt change and stay relevant to society. This should give us the power to now do the next step and change again. So when it says change and when we need to change, we've demonstrated in the past that we can do it, so why not do it now? Zoos, gardens and museums, in my opinion, have to become much more political organizations. They need to be change agents, conveners and pacemakers. Um, I think our mission needs to become care for society and the planet, um, and I think it's high time that somebody takes on that agenda. In Germany, as you know, it's now people under 18 who go onto the streets every Friday in their droves and demand action, not just words, and it's up to us to see what we can do with that. I think we need new coalitions for action. It has to be global, and faith, science, and society is perhaps not a bad mix, and I think this is also why, and I'm very grateful for Joachim um, and the bishop to bring this together. I think this needs to be discussed where we can go. Also, from my own experience, it won't be an easy task because I think we need to win people over one by one. Um, there are seven or eight billion of us, so um, it's a bit of work to do. However, that people are interested in talking about the future of the world, perhaps you can see on this little picture. It's not the best one, but at least it gives you an idea. So this is um, every Friday at two o'clock after the demonstrations in Berlin of the pupils have ended, we invite the pupils to come to the museum and talk to scientists, either to scientists of the museum or to scientists um, that are friends and colleagues. And here, there, you see um, a distinguished elderly gentleman. He is the chair of the five wise men advising the German um, government on the economy. And so you have enough people who are willing to talk and you have young people who are willing to engage. And it's about learning from each other and four hours later, they all went home. So there is a huge interest in engagement. We are the places that people love and care we have the science. I think we need to change and open our doors. So in the capitalist system, and that's what we are in, um, this is the phrase that apparently governs capitalism, deep change, or slow death. 
And um, as far as I'm concerned, for my organization, we've decided what side of the equation we are going to be on. And it's not going to be slow death. So thank you very much for your attention.